Good morning. Um, welcome to our uh, second lecture on the repeated measures design. This is actually hypothesis test number three. Uh, this is a situation where we have one group of subjects, if you remember, uh, measured twice, pre-test, post-test, with that treatment in the middle. So we're going to be dealing uh, with experiments, looking for a significant difference between the pretest and the post-test. Uh, we said that our sampling distribution changes now to what we call a sampling distribution of differences between means. So before, if we remember, in, in hypothesis test number one and two, we were equating x bar to mu on a sampling distribution of the mean. Now we're equating d bar, right, the mean difference, to the mean of the mean differences, which we call mu sub d bar. So the central limit theorem still applies, right? Normally distributed set of an infinite amount of mean differences. So instead of uh, an infinite amount of x bars on this sampling distribution, we have an infinite amount of d bars. And our task in this third hypothesis test is, is to determine where this individual mean difference falls on this sampling distribution of mean differences. If it falls out in the tails, we have enough evidence to reject the null and you know, conclude that the distance from the mid-region is large enough to be deemed significantly different, right? If that d-bar falls somewhere in the middle, that t statistic will be not real large and we'll accept the null. And we'll say that that distance from mu sub d bar isn't large enough to be deemed significantly different. We have this t test that we call the correlated t test. Mean difference divided by standard error of the difference. So mean difference over error estimate, just like we did before mean difference over error estimate, this standard error of the difference is just simply the standard deviation of the difference column divided by the square root of the sample size. You all have a handout in front of you. This first example is from the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. This is uh, actually about a, a weight reduction program for cats. The University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine conducted a study on the effectiveness of a health and nutrition program for cats. They randomly selected 15 cats from a population and measured their weights. The researchers then administered a 12-week program of healthy diet and exercise. After the 12 weeks, the researchers weighed them again. Did the program have a significant effect on reducing the overall weight of the cats? Hmm, I don't know. I don't know yet anyway. What I do know is that we have a dependent variable that is weight. That's actually what we're measuring. So these numbers that we see here are weights of cats. You know, cat number one weighed in at 18 pounds, weighed out at 12 pounds for a difference of six and so on. You know, cat number seven weighed in at 26 pounds, weighed out at 27 pounds for a difference of one and so on and so forth. So we have pretest data, post-test data, and difference data. And we're looking for a significant difference between pretest and post-test, right? Did the treatment, which is this, this is the weight loss program, have a significant effect at reducing the overall weight of the cats? The first thing we do when we get any data set is to look at it. You know, when you, when you look at baseball box scores, yeah, I mean, you, you look at them when you look at swimming results for the Nationals. You, you look at it. It tells you some things. I mean, it's, it's obvious, yeah, but it tells you stuff. Okay, same with there. You know, data, look at it. We have a mean difference here. We actually have um, a 2.2 pound reduction. We have a 2.2 pound overall reduction. Now our job is to determine, you know, you know, did, did these cats lose a significant amount of weight? 
you know, where does this 2.2 fall on the sampling distribution of differences between means? We have a null hypothesis which states that the pretest and the post-test in the population are equal and we know that this implies no difference, no effect, so to speak. And another way of writing this, mu sub d bar equals zero, you know, no difference. The alternative hypothesis, two-tailed, is that the, the pretest mean in the population is not equal to the post-test mean. You know, there is a difference. You know, there is an effect. Our goal in this thing, of course, is to try to reject the statement, thereby accepting this statement. This thing calls for an O5 alpha and a two-tailed test. Uh, the researcher chose a two-tailed test for a couple of reasons. Number one, you know, before they gathered uh, these post-test scores, they didn't know whether the cats would lose weight or gain. They might have all gained weight, or they, you know what I'm saying? There might have been a net increase. Picked a two-tailed test just to be safe, but we know that the two-tailed test uh, in, in the scientific realm is much more credible. It's kind of a higher standard of null hypothesis rejection, a higher criterion, so to speak. And we know, of course, that before we run any statistical test, our p equals alpha. Degrees of freedom is n minus 1. We have an n of 15. 15 minus 1 is 14. We can find a t critical value. We get our books out. We go back to the t tables. <coughs> And we know that the t-tables in our textbooks, these t-tables in our textbooks are a one-tailed set of t-critical values. So what do we have to do? We're running a two-tailed test. What do we have to do? We have to divide alpha by 2 to get the area in the one tail. We go across the top to 025, down the side to 14. We have a number. What is that number? It's 2.145, positive and negative. Our critical values are 2.145. This is telling us that about 95% of the area under this particular sampling distribution at 14 degrees of freedom falls within this interval. 2.5% falls from here back, right? 2.5% area falls from here back. 2.5 plus 2.5 equals 5%. Our mission here is to compute T. Well, we already have the numerator, D bar. In this case, it's 2.2. .2. Mean difference of 2.2 pounds, that's our dependent variable. We also know that that's ratio data. Why? Because we you know, have a true zero point. Our next step is to compute the standard error of the difference, this denominator. This requires us to compute a standard deviation of this difference column of scores. So we treat this difference column of scores just like we would any X data set. And our job here is to compute the standard deviation of this set of scores. And we know what the standard deviation is, don't we? It's the square root of the variance, right? So we use this computational formula for standard deviation. We are now revisiting about the second week of class. And if we remember, we have to get the data set ready to make this computation. We have to square each x data point.
we square each x data point. And if you remember, we bring everything down to sum. We do a sum x. We do the sum x, the quantity squared, and a sum x squared, and we know n is 15. n is not 14, no, df is 14. n is 15. So we do some simple summations. In this case, our sum x is 33, and we take this number and square it, 33 squared, 1089. And then we take the sum x squared, the sum of the squared x's, in this case is 193. With an n of 15, uh, we're ready to go. Let's compute the standard deviation of this difference column of scores. Again, the whole purpose of this is to come up with this denominator. So we just plug in. The standard deviation of the different column of scores is the square root of the variance. Sum x squared, 193, minus the sum x quantity squared, 1089, over the n of uh, 15, all over the n of 15. Get it all set up. Remember our order of operations. So we say, the standard deviation of the difference column of scores, square root of 193 minus this whole quantity here, 1089 divided by 15 is 72.6 over 15. One ninety three minus seventy two point six is one twenty point four over fifteen. This ratio is eight point oh three. And the square root of eight point oh three is two point eight three. 2.83. So the standard deviation of this difference column of scores is 2.83. Great. We can now use this to compute the standard error of the difference. So we just say the standard error of the difference is the S sub D we computed, the standard deviation of the difference column, 2.83 divided by the square root of the sample size, 15. That's 2.83. Square root of 15 is 3.87. Standard error of the difference uh, in this case is 0.73 or something real close. So class, we know, of course, because we're now more than halfway through the semester and we're really getting good at this stuff, one T unit, in this case, is 0.73, right? 0.73 what? Pounds, pounds. yeah, 0.73 pounds. So let's put 0.73 where it belongs. T equals 2.2 divided by 0.73. Our T statistic in this case is equal to positive 3.01. Positive 3.01. We make a decision now. We compare the calculated statistic with the critical value. We see that it exceeds it in the positive direction. Actually, that D bar of 2.2 Right about here, see that? Our decision based on this null is to do what? Reject. Yeah, reject the null, yep. And again, the whole purpose of this is to answer a research question. Let's do that. This question asks us, did the program have a significant effect on reducing the overall weight of the cats? 
Yeah, apparently so. <coughs> and if we're wondering why, you know, why? Well, it's because this T of 3.01, which corresponds to this D bar of 2.2, this is a rare event. Rare events are significant events. We have statistical significance. Another way of looking at this, the distance from here to here has been deemed large enough to be deemed significantly large enough. We have some pretty strong evidence that suggests that what's actually happening here is pretty real and exists in the population. As a result of the needle shift on this side, guys, from here over to 3.01, what was its total effect on the P region? What happened to P? Yeah, it got smaller than alpha. And that's just simply the result, it's just simply the result of, you know, this needle shifting over here. This needle stayed right here. This area remained at 2.5%. But this needle shifted from here over to 3.01 and made this, see, it smushed this area of P down to something smaller. And its total effect on P was to make it smaller than 5% of the area under the sampling distribution of differences between means. So again, we rejected this statement, uh, therefore accepting this statement, which states that yeah, there's a difference in the population. Now if you notice, class, they mentioned randomization. They randomly selected 15 cats from a population. They don't tell us how big that population is, but because we've utilized randomization, we now have the ability to do what? Generalize back to the population. What this is telling us is that, hmm, what we're observing here is highly likely to also be occurring in the population from which the sample was selected because each member of that population had an equal likelihood of being selected. They may have had a thousand cats, randomized them, and randomly selected 15 of them for this study. And if you notice, little teeny ones, little five pounders, and some, you know, little bigger ones. You know, there's... I think the number nine is ridiculous. And by the way, on your sheets, there is a typo. If you notice on your sheets, there's, uh, so you have to correct those typos. Um, now again, there's a small chance that, you know, we may have made an incorrect decision in rejecting this null. So I rejected with some pretty high certainty. And what's the status of, of beta, guys? What, what is beta? Yeah, it's the like, it's a likelihood of a type 2 error, and in this case, it's irrelevant. So there's a small chance I may have made a type 1 error, and the likelihood I may have made a type 2 error just kind of is, is, is not even in the picture here. So as you guys see, this is, um, you know, a bit more involved. Um, but we're doing the same thing. We're, we're testing, a, we're, we're trying to answer a research question. We're, we're testing a null, so to speak. We're testing a null, you know, of no difference. And we're trying to reject it. In this case, we did. Okay, um, this next example uh, is actually out of the world of advertising. Uh, this next example is, uh, it's about an ad campaign um, that is designed to get people to quit smoking. Let's take a look at what this is doing. And by the way, uh, example 10-12 in your books is kind of sort of apples to apples you know, with what we're doing here. As a part of a study to reduce smoking, a national organization ran an ad campaign to convince people to quit smoking. To evaluate the effectiveness of their campaign, they randomly selected 15 subjects from a population and recorded the number of cigarettes smoked per day 
in the week before and the week after exposure to the ad. So the ad is actually the treatment. Did the ad campaign have a significant effect at reducing smoking? I don't know. We see a bunch of uh, numbers here. These numbers are the number of cigarettes smoked per day. Let me just write them down here. So subject number one smoked 45 cigarettes per day before the ad, 43 after the ad for a difference of two and so on. Subject number two, 16 before the ad, 20 after the ad for a difference of negative four. So let me get the numbers in here. We have a pretest mean of 28.26 cigarettes. Post-test mean, if we sum the post-test column and divide by 15, we get 27.93. Differences, we just this minus this equals this and so on. If we sum this difference column and divide by 15, we get a D bar of 0.33. About a third of a cigarette difference smoked per day. About a third of a cigarette difference smoked per day. Now like I said, whenever you get a data set, the first thing you do is look at it. Whenever you get a data set, the first thing you do is look at it. You inspect it. Let's inspect this. Remember, we're really dealing in differences and possible significant differences. Look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven individuals out of this 15 actually smoked more cigarettes after the ad campaign. With, we have a, a third of a cigarette reduction. Do you think, just off the top of your head, in terms of the anecdotal evidence, the anecdotal evidence, like what you see on the surface, what do you think our decision is going to be? Yeah, I don't think we have a significant effect here. I think we're going to ultimately accept the null, but we can't go on that evidence alone. This is all about quantitative evidence. We have to crunch the hard numbers. And these hard numbers, these hard results will tell us something. That's the whole point of this class. But ultimately what we're trying to ascertain, where does this individual D-bar fall on the sampling distribution of D-bars? Now again, just go through the drill. We have our null and our alternative hypothesis. Uh, by the way, on the exam, which is going to be the Tuesday after we get back from spring break. Um, you know, you'll be doing this. You'll have a formula sheet. One of the questions will be list the null and the alternative. If you write it like this, you'll get it correct. Okay? We have an O5 alpha and a two-tailed test. We know that before we run any statistical test, P equals alpha. Our N is 15. Uh, 15 minus 1 is 14. We have 14 degrees of freedom. <clears throat> O5 alpha two-tailed test, we can find a critical value. And again, we know that in order to do that, because this table is a one-tailed set of t-critical values, and we're running a two-tailed test, we have to divide alpha by 2, 
to get the area in the one tail, which in this case is 2.5%. Alpha is still 0.5, by the way. Alpha is not 0.25. Alpha is still 0.05. We're simply doing this extra procedure in order to find the critical value. And we go across the top to 0.25, down the side to 14, and there's a number there. And what is that number? 2.145. It's 2.145, and we know if T exceeds this in either direction, we have enough evidence to reject the null. We actually have the numerator for the T statistic, D bar, which in this case is 0.33. We have to determine this denominator, the standard error of the difference. We know in order to do this, we need to compute a standard deviation of this difference column divided by the square root of n. And, and ladies and gentlemen, do not confuse this with this. Don't confuse this with this. This is the standard deviation of the difference column of scores. This is the standard error of the difference. We use this to obtain this, but don't let these, you know, this is d bar, this is just a d. So again, we have to revisit our computational formula for standard deviation, which we know is the square root of the variance, right? We have to get the data set ready to be able to do that. We have to square each uh, x data point. Let's do that. And again, we bring everything down to sum, you know, with an n of 15. Uh, we do a sum x, a sum x quantity squared, and a sum x squared. Simple summations. Uh, in this case, sum x is 5. 5 squared is 25. Uh, sum x squared is 117. With an n of 15, we're ready to go. Uh, the standard deviation of the difference column of scores is the square root of the variance. We plug in uh, sum x squared, 117, minus the sum x quantity squared, 25, over the n of uh, 15, all over the n of 15. Just put everything where it belongs. And we follow just a simple order of operations. This becomes 117 minus this quantity here, 1.67 over 15. That's 115.33. over 15. That ratio is 7.69. The standard deviation of um, our difference column of scores in this case is 0.74 or something pretty close. So we use this to determine our standard error of the difference, and we'll have our denominator. Standard error of the difference, if we look over here, standard deviation of the difference column of scores, 0.74 over the square root of our sample size. Excuse me, that is incorrect. Oh. Standard, and we got this on film. Oh, I hate that. S sub D is 2.77, or something pretty close. Oh, I am sorry. And of course, this is all live, so it's kind of like doing live TV. Hi. I make a mistake once in a while. 
So the standard deviation of this difference column of scores is 2.77 or something pretty close. And so we can now take this and compute um, the standard error of the difference, 2.77 divided by the square root of our sample size, uh, 15. It's 2.77. Square root of 15 is 3.87. Standard error of the difference is 0.74, or something pretty close. I was actually looking at the wrong number. <laughs> and so we put the 0.74. We know that in this case, one T unit is 0.74. Um, we put the 0.74 where it belongs, in the denominator. And in this case, T equals positive 0.45. Or something pretty close. If you got 0.46, that's fine. T is right about here. Corresponds to the D bar right about here. We compare the calculated statistic to the critical value. We see it doesn't exceed it. Therefore, our decision in this case is to do what? Accept yeah, accept the null. Yeah. Um, what happens to the P region as a result of this? Yeah, it got bigger. If P is greater than alpha, we accept the null. And we know that, you know, again, the needles were here and here. Um, T turned into positive 0.45. This needle stayed right here. Therefore, this area remained at 2.5%. But this needle shifted from here all the way over to 0.45 and made this area of P way, way, way big. Therefore, having a total effect on P of making it you know, way larger than 5% of the area under the sampling distribution of differences between means. Let's answer the question. So based on what we've discovered here, um, did the ad campaign have a significant effect at reducing smoking? Apparently not. Apparently what we're seeing here is just probably a, just a result of chance. What's most likely happening in the population is that there's no difference between the pre-test and the post-test. And we know, of course, that um, <coughs> alpha is irrelevant. Small chance we may have made a type 2 error. Small chance we may have made a type 2 error. So again, you know, the correlated t-test, repeated measures design. Uh, it has two other names, though. That correlated t is also called the paired t-test, right? It's also called the dependent sample t-test. OK, let's try this again. Just give me a second. Uh, this next example is all about uh, the effects of alcohol on reaction time. The effects of, you know, drinking one shot of 100 proof alcohol and the effects it has on reaction time. Let's look at what's going on here. A researcher is interested in knowing the effect, again, this is trying to establish evidence for cause and effect, uh, which one ounce of 100 proof alcohol has on his subjects. To study this effect, the researcher randomly selects 10 subjects and records their reaction times in seconds, that's the DV, both before and after drinking one ounce of 100 proof alcohol. Can the researcher conclude at alpha 01 we have a more conservative alpha, but also a less powerful alpha, right? That the average reaction time is longer after consuming one ounce of 100 proof alcohol? I don't know. 
So we have these numbers, which of course are our dependent variable. Subject number one took, you know, uh, reaction time 0.4 seconds. After the shot of 100 proof alcohol, reaction time 0.5 seconds for a difference of negative 0.1, and so on. A little bit slower, a little bit slower. What do you think the effect is of alcohol on reaction time? Yeah, it, it, slow, it slows you down. We have laws about driving and so on. Uh, these are the numbers on the dependent variable. Uh, we have a pretest mean equal to 0.47 seconds. Post test scores. Post test mean equal to 0.58. Difference scores. This minus this equals this. This minus this is zero, and so on. Let me just get those in there. If we sum these difference column scores, we get a d bar of uh, negative 0.11. We can also obtain this again by just saying this minus this equals this. This minus this equals this. So we look at the data. You look at it. This is a course in data analysis. So you know you look. What do we see here at least on the surface? We see about a 0.11 second difference overall after the introduction of the experimental treatment. And, but you know what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these ten subjects are actually slower. You know, do you think this one shot of 100 proof alcohol has a significant effect on, you know, slowing the overall reaction time, actually increasing? You know, the reaction time, that's what slower is. You know, well, you know, on the surface I would say yeah. I, you know, I would say yeah. Now this, let's inspect this, you know, quantitatively, scientifically. We're really wondering where this individual uh, D-bar falls on the sampling distribution of D-bars. And we know that if it falls in one of the tails, that event is going to be considered <coughs> rare enough to be deemed a significant event. If this D-bar falls in the middle somewhere, you know, that distance from the mean isn't going to be considered large enough to be significantly different. It's going to be considered just like a common everyday event. So again, rejecting the null implies statistical rarity. Now, um, on your little worksheet here, you have some questions. Uh, your homework is to fill in, you know, complete this little exercise. Now again, want to, you know, write the null and the alternative. Find the t-critical values. We have an O1 alpha and a two-tailed test, right? We know that before we run any statistical test, P equals alpha. Degrees of freedom is N minus 1. We can find a critical value, divide alpha by 2, right, to get the area in the one tail. Do what we do. Find T. Make the decision. 3.25. Make the decision. I will tell you that <clears throat> um, the result, the actual T result, is negative 5. So I would like all of you to, um, you know, get, you know, this end result. And I would also like all of you to, uh, you know, make that interpretation. Um, 
Tuesday morning, we will pick this up, you know, where we left off. And that concludes uh, this uh, lecture session on the uh, repeated measures, measures design correlated t-test. I will see you guys Tuesday.